Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, James Kim. I'm the chairman and CEO of AmCham uh, Korea. Uh, today's webinar is something that's very special to me. Uh, the title is called The World of Sports Beyond COVID-19. And believe it or not, uh, since uh, the pandemic, this is our 13th edition of the AmCham webinar series since we launched uh, this uh, platform. And we've had uh, an amazing turnout uh, you know, through all of our webinars and today there's no uh, difference as well. Uh, you know, it's amazing that because of uh, this platform, we can host uh, special guests from all over the world. Uh, and we have uh, three special guests joining us from the United States. Uh, first and foremost, I want to introduce a couple of uh, special guests. We have uh, Leif Rogers and David Noyle. They're both the principals of uh, the Red Phoenix Entertainment uh, you know, Organization. Uh, they're also uh, an AmCham Korea member. Uh, very, very proud to have them. Uh, Leif Rogers was in uh, China. He was very active in one of the AmCham chambers as one of the senior leaders there. And I've gotten to know David Noel a lot, one of the, the brilliant strategists and minds when it comes to, to sports. Uh, I don't know Maurice Evans that well, but uh, you saw his bio. He's played uh, in the NBA. Uh, he's hung out with people like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Uh, and he was very involved in all the NBA players negotiations as well, which uh, means that uh, you really, really have to be very good and very knowledgeable about how the sports world uh, operates. So we're gonna have a very interesting session today. Uh, before I start with some q and I wanted to give uh, you know, my friends an opportunity to say a couple of words, and then we can get the, uh, the Q&A started. So let me turn it over to either Leif or David, and hopefully with, uh, with Mo Evans, to make a brief introduction uh, before we get started. So David, Leif, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi, James, thank you so much. And we're honored to be here. As you know, I was a, um, a chairman of AmCham in Northeast China and a big supporter of AmCham China. Mo was kicked off. We've been on for about 20 minutes and he's getting logged in now. So he should be joining us shortly, but um, Anyway, yeah, I mean, uh, COVID has been devastating for sports um, across the world, as we're all aware of. Uh, but there are, um, today, Major League Baseball is starting up, and Korea led the way for the whole world to kind of serve as a model. And so we're hoping to discuss that today. And then the changes you're seeing in uh, sports and with sports marketing and sponsorships and just how things are done where have kicked into gear with COVID, but we're already happening on a broad sense anyway. And in terms of accessibility, digital platforms, uh, price points, return on investment for sponsorships. So it wasn't like COVID, um, it's obviously kicked everything into gear, but the, the changes you're seeing across the landscape of the world were changes that were gonna happen over the long term anyway. And so David and I will talk about this today and some of the bright spots of, you know, such a horrible pandemic and devastating situation. And the fact that uh, Korea itself was such, so front and center and such a role model for the entire world uh, to give hope that sports could be, you know, started. And, and now we're seeing the results of that. Dave, you're on mute if you want to add to that. Yeah, sure. No, I completely echo Leif's sentiment. And, and thank you again, uh, James, and to, to everybody at AmCham for making this possible. Um, the only thing I would add is I think there's a very strong case for uh, companies in Korea and Korean brands, American brands, et cetera, um, to continue to, to engage with sports and sports marketing to reach their audiences. Um, and, you know, as we can discuss later, although COVID has disrupted a lot of how traditionally that was happening, um, there's more opportunity than ever to continue to do sports marketing and at very um, at cost effective approaches as well. So um, I, I think Korea is a natural um, is naturally attractive to many, especially Americans and American athletes and teams. And so I, 
we, we very firmly believe that there's a strong possibility in, um, in the future for, for further collaboration. A pretty big audience today of, uh, of CEOs of multinational companies. Uh, we have people who are very interested in sports, but as an AmCham, uh, the business environment is very important mm -hmm. because I think that sports is such a, you know, a big uh, platform for, for companies to utilize. Uh, global sports stars are such a big asset uh, in accelerating a lot of companies' growth anywhere in the world. So that's the reason why with both of you here, and I'm sure we'll have Mo joining us, uh, you know, any minute, is very, very important. You know, Leif, uh, you were involved in getting uh, Mookie Betts uh, involved here in South Korea. Uh, yesterday, he signed, what, the third largest sports contract in history. What was it, 385 million U.S. dollars over 12 years. And he's 27 years old, uh, so until, I guess, he becomes 40, his life is set forever. Uh, and I think that people like you and David have helped uh, people like Mookie uh, accelerate his, uh, you know, his marketability throughout the world. So Leaf, I know you guys have done a lot in, in China with, with huge sports stars such as James Harden. Walk us through uh, what you guys do and how you have helped people like James Harden and some of these other big sports stars market themselves in Asia. Actually, I'm going to give that one to Dave because he says it's much more, it says so much better than I can. So uh, I'll hand that one to you, Dave, on what we do on a broad sense. Yeah, um, yeah no, it's so uh, largely speaking, you know, we serve as a bridge between sports and entertainment and markets in Asia. Um, but, but really how, what we do is we, we work with brands, we work with agents and athletes, we work with teams. And we really try to identify what their strategy is. So when you take a sports team, for example, you know, oftentimes they're looking for sponsors across, across the world. Um, athletes, of course, want to um, find endorsements and other business opportunities that will prolong their career um, even beyond sports. And brands, of course, want to, uh, to, to sell products to their clients and, and to engage with their customers. Um, and so depending on, on, on who you are, we'll, we'll work with you in a different way. But largely speaking, we really create that bridge. And so to, to follow up on your point, James, about uh, James Harden, for example, as probably most of us know, the NBA is wildly popular in China. Uh, they had some issues this last fall, which, which were definitely, they, they impacted us for sure. But James, prior to the whole Daryl Morey tweet, um, you know, there was a big demand for James Harden. Um, and we worked with a, a large bank in Shanghai called SPB Bank. They didn't know how to get a hold of James. They didn't really know how to activate a commercial. Um, they were pretty new to, to the whole space. And so really they hired us to help them with that whole suite of services from negotiating the contract, literally planning James's trip to Shanghai, uh, filming the commercials, et cetera. Um, you know, we've done similar projects like that with Kobe Bryant, uh, who unfortunately just passed away. Uh, earlier this year, um, you know, we've worked with MVPs from every major sports league. Um, but, it, you know, it's not just working with athletes or with Asian brands. It's actually helping American brands get overseas as well. Um, and that could be through leveraging um, Asian athletes, you know, if it's in Korea, Korean athlete or in Japan, Japanese, etc. Um, helping them to plan grassroots marketing campaigns. So, you know, you brought up Mookie Betts. Um, and Mookie and his, his team um, really had that desire to connect with the Korean audience, um, but you know they, they wanted some help in, in actually doing that. And so that's really where we got, uh, we rolled up our sleeves and helped them really launch an entire PR campaign, which was pretty successful um, you know, with, with your help as well, James. And so you know that's kind of a large, a long answer, but there's a lot of ways we can work in this space, but what it really comes down to is just bridging cultures and helping to kind of match up uh, the need over here to the service providers over here and making sure that it's seamless along the way. And surprisingly, you would think that a business like this would have existed a long time ago, but there's really not a lot of groups like us who are doing this. And so we're hoping to, uh, to do it even more and to help, to help brands continue to, to do sports marketing. That's great. And also, I'm so happy to see Maurice Evans here on, uh, on the screen. We were actually saying good things about you, Maurice, so you didn't really 
miss much, but uh, Leif and David tell me that you're one of the most articulate, most thoughtful athletes they've ever dealt with. So I'm personally honored that uh, you have joined us today, Maurice. Uh, no, sorry for the technical difficulties. And uh, Leif and David, they both uh, owe them a little bit of money for all the great compliments. But these guys are great to have worked with. We've uh, done some amazing things over the past couple of years, as David just mentioned. And it's an honor to be here with you guys. So good morning to you all. Great, thank you. So uh, let, let's just get to the core of uh, you know, why we're even here today uh, and why we're even using this technology to talk about uh, you know, sports. So since COVID-19, uh, hey, how has the sports world really changed uh, you know, from your perspective? And maybe we can go straight to you, Maurice, because I know you have a lot of friends who are, who are athletes today. You work with a lot of sports teams today, and uh, you're probably one of the, the domain experts uh, from the other side of the equation. So walk us and, through. Uh, sure. Well, you know, we, we used to think of sports, professional sports, that is, a, as recession-proof, recession-resilient. And uh, I think it took an act of God, which is actually taking place in coronavirus and COVID-19, to actually impact the industry as we've seen it today. Um, a, a work stoppage across the board, across not only just the United States, but around the world. Uh, athletes are now having to think beyond just the game and truly, um, you know, make decisions about their, um, their family, their livelihoods, the people who are their parents, their children. Uh, there's notable uh, NBA players who have decided not to participate in the restart. Uh, Kyrie Irving being one of them, DeAndre uh, Jordan, another uh, multiple players because uh, Avery Bradley is another player for the Lakers. His son has a respiratory uh, issue and, and he could easily um, possibly, you know, infect his son and, and possibly, you know, create a, a really dire situation for him family. So for us, it's just uh, that's something that as an athlete, you never, ever thought you would uh, see a day when, um, you know, a work stoppage would be possible due to an airborne virus. You know, playing without fans is something that, uh, you know, we a lot of times we play this game not only for obviously to make money and take care of our families, but the, the fan engagement is something that's extremely important. And when you look at it from a business perspective, as Leif and David will be able to attest to speak to as well, it's really accelerated on, and really, um, you know, uh, moved a lot of companies out of the way that, that have business models that are dying out. Now, fan engagement, virtual environments, technology is more rampant now more than ever. And we've seen that kind of take place. Yeah, you know, you talked about fan engagement. Uh, as a former athlete uh, yourself, uh, are you able to, you know, be your best without fans? And how is that going to impact uh, just the performance aspect uh, for professional sports today? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of players are driven by the competition, and a part of that competition is also playing for something bigger than yourself, which is playing for fans. There's there's uh, fan bases that haven't won championships in years, and uh, to be able to enrich those communities by bringing the championship and bringing wins. You look at how the Washington Nationals won just last year the MLB, MLB pennant, and it totally united uh, Washington. You look at I'm from Kansas to see the Kansas City Chiefs win. A Super Bowl. It was just amazing. And the people who we were able to connect to in terms of our family and friends that you haven't talked to. And so to now go out there and compete without having anybody, virtual noise and things like that, that's trying to simulate what it would be like to uh, have fans, it, it, it's not the same. And, and for me, I was always a great practice player. So I think I could have done well without the pressure of having fans yelling and, and making, uh, you know, noise. But on a serious note, I think that's going to deeply impact the fans and I, I, um, the players. And additionally, I think now more than ever, players are really having to think about what it is they have going on beyond the game. Because many of the guys are not uh, getting paid what they thought they were. Free agents are uh, significantly impacted. Guys who thought, because most free agencies is based, is based off the salary cap. The salary cap will significantly be impacted with the work stoppage. So now with a shrunken salary cap, free agents who have held out or didn't sign long-term deals last year when they could have during free agency or during the season are going to be significantly impacted. Another thing that's really important is content. 
Um, as David just mentioned, the documentaries and different things that Red Phoenix has been able to do over the past year, last uh, you know, nine to 12 months, that content is very, very rich because fans are sitting at home. If, you, if anybody's seen the Last Dance documentary that featured the Chicago Bulls in 1998, that's 20 year old content. That was the number one viewed documentary on Netflix. So, well, you know, I think Mo, you talked a little bit about the about referring to Leaf and David on the on the business equation. You know, hey, Leaf and David, I can tell you that uh, some of our member companies are doing really well despite COVID because they have transformed their business model to more e-commerce. Right. Uh, so, from just your perspective. Uh, without fans, how does this impact the business of, of sports? Yeah, it's been completely devastating. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And um, I mean, across the board for the fans, the players, the brands, the brands are all um, dealing with their own internal issues and uh, you know their own economics. And so the first thing that's cut is marketing dollars and endorsement deals and, but on a more positive light, kind of what Mo touched on and we touched on in the beginning is the, the, the transition you're seeing. I mean, we were, the NFL is always kind of the, the last one to catch along the lines and the NBA is very forefront and always trying something new and the NFL is very slow to grasp and just the, the pitches and proposals that NFL teams were giving out in March to, in comparison to what they're giving out here in June and July are dramatically different. It's much more uh, rather than sweets. And I mean, this is a consequence of not being able to have things in sweets, but the main focus is on digital content, on uh, uh, digital platforms, pre-game, post-game, during game. And this is, again, James, reflective of our time and not just because of COVID. Uh, the younger generation does not want to go sit in a game and watch an entire game. They don't want to sit and watch an entire baseball game uh, on television all night. And so COVID's been able to help highlight how they're going to transform and, uh, you know, where it's, it's they're, they're logging in short content, Instagram, TikTok, these kind of platforms. And uh, COVID's accelerated that because right now that's the only kind of platforms that you can do sports content through. And, um, you know, and to most point with documentaries, I believe that's the most watched documentary ever. And so you're seeing a lot more where players and, and brands are trying to target a particular demographic, a particular market and through a niche sport, not necessarily your big three, could be skateboarding or snowboarding or something to target a, 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 just a specific demographic in a much more digital and virtual platform. And uh, uh, so we could see this coming and now it's, we're seeing it just every single day. And Dave, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's a buyer's market. So if you're a brand, I mean, there's some good deals to be had on traditional sponsorships because a lot of these teams are just trying to hold on to sponsors in general. Um, with some of the uncertainty of, of this year. But uh, so there's some good deals to be had there, but I think more importantly, from a brand perspective, it's a really strong opportunity to evolve into kind of like to Leif's point, what's been naturally happening anyway, which is really this drive towards e-commerce and, uh, and uh, reaching audiences digitally and kind of micro-targeting who they are rather than spending millions of dollars on a big billboard for the most famous people. You, famous person you could think of in the hopes that it appeals to as many people as it can. So now on the team side, that, that's a little bit, it's a little bit harder to see the, the um, how to make the, the lemonade out of the lemons um, because they are, they're taking a, a killing on losing out on ticket sales. You know, a lot of their money comes from that traditional sponsorship. And so uh, they'll be okay. You know, I mean, they're going to figure it out, but what we hope is that you start seeing the teams get more creative with what they're offering, both to audiences and to sponsors. Um, you know, we'd like to see more kind of um, cam different camera angles, cameras down on the court, you know, cameras down on the field to really capture and pull people back in, maybe showing new views, um, you know, different, different types of, of also attracting sponsors to the sport as well. So um, it's definitely disruptive. But I, you know, there's a lot of good things that can come out of it too. 
Right. You know, I like and that word. I, I was just going to say, with regards to just fans in the stands, again, Korea, Japan, at first they put in mannequins, and then they put in cardboard cutouts, and then it moved to Japan, I believe, where they were uh, putting in robots that chanted the team slogan and sang the song and to try to give the players when they're up to bat to, so they could hear it. And then the CBA in China, then, which we just thought was fascinating, they put in a large screen on the court side of actual live stream fans from across China watching yeah. them play. So as the player looks up, here's, you know, 150 faces from across China. And that, that was kind of the, if you're, there's anything great about a global pandemic and how devastating this has been to sports, is watching that, how that evolved. And then we noticed today for opening day in MLB, the Houston Astros also had cardboard cutouts of fans and their fans too. So everybody's kind of learning off each other as it goes. Well, the, uh, the digital form, uh, you know, transformation is amazing, you know, with all these uh, examples you just gave out. I like the word, it's a buyer's market right now. So yeah. I hope that uh, just our audience uh, here at Amsham with all the the Korean companies and American companies here. Uh, this is a special opportunity to to really get what you want, maybe at a lower than the usual price. Although when I see Mookie Betts contract at three hundred and eighty five million, uh, I don't know what kind of a, a discount that is, but that's still a lot of money. So and that was because we were so effective, James, with your help on that Korea campaign. Yeah. But let me ask you this, you know, if, if this was not a COVID situation, uh, what would he have gotten? <laughs> right? It could have been a you know five hundred million dollar contract. So for him, it cost him probably a hundred million dollars, and which means there's a lot of opportunities out there. As an optimist, I think that uh, you're going to have the winners. You're going to have the people who are going to have a hard time. But now's the time to I think be very creative. Uh, which leads to my next question, which is there's still a lot of sports out there that are still not really 100% confirmed, right? Number one, NFL, which is the U.S. most fan-based, uh, you know, sports. We got Olympics that are postponed to next year. So, Mo, what's your prediction? Are we going to see NFL? Are we going to see Olympics as scheduled? Well, we know that the Olympics has already been postponed to 2021. Um, you know, I think the N NFL is really going to uh, have to be very, very proactive and uh, innovative in their approach to the season. Uh, I think a lot of that hinges on how well the NBA does with this restart. I was really encouraged to see that they had zero uh, positive COVID tests and that they were ready for their restart. And, you know, having um, close friends who are there that I've communicated with. And, um, you know, they've talked about just the protocols that they've implemented, the medical staff that they have there. Um, you know, many of the individuals had to literally take a swab and send it in at home prior to even uh, entering into the bubble and get a, a, a result and, and quarantine and do different things. So I think it is very much possible to, uh, to have a season and do it in a safe way, but it's gonna take a lot of effort and, and to the point that everyone mentioned, I think that the fans are not going to be able to, to be in the stadiums in the same way that they would have been uh, normally. I think uh, stadiums that are outside maybe um, possibly play a little bit uh, half fans uh, sooner than those who are indoor. I think a lot will hinge as well on how MLB does and if players get uh, a lot of positive tests. Um, one of the things that we talked about in terms of accelerating uh, different business models and activating them in terms of during this uh, COVID situation one thing that we haven't really mentioned or that may have been mentioned when I dropped off a little bit was just the, the, the virtual reality and augmented reality and how those type of companies, uh, the opportunities in that market, it's already a multi-billion dollar market and, and being able to now, you know, wear the, the virtual reality goggles and be able to have that really intimate experience from home. I think those types of companies will try to be, uh, take advantage of, of some of the opportunity there. So as you see the uh, the restart of uh, NBA, the Major League Baseball and NBA, uh, how are the the athletes doing with masks? Are do you are you seeing them wear masks today, or is that something that they kind of staying away from, or, or what? James Harden took a lot of fight for the mask that he 
he wore um, when he entered into the bubble. Um, obviously, masks are mandatory in certain situations when you're not playing and when you're, um, you know, walking around or, or, or doing certain activities. And he wore a certain mask that was pretty controversial. We obviously have a lot of uh, challenges with the death of, uh, you know, George Floyd here in the United States that provoked a lot of, uh, you know, racial tensions and different uh, civil unrest. And um, he wore a mask that kind of, uh, you know, reflected some controversial uh, issues and, and stoked a lot of flames. And he took a lot of fight for it. He said he did it inadvertently. But um, yeah, you know, masks are going to be uh, important. Um, just to kind of um, speak a little bit to that question that you had just asked about who are going to be some of the losers. Unfortunately, a lot of um, young uh, talent in this country has already lost out and just globally um, college seniors who are going to be, um, you know, entering to college. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, college um, you know, like NCAA tournament was postponed and canceled yes. here in the United States. There hasn't been a draft for the NBA. It's been postponed until after the season. Um, now that we have such a late start with the um, NBA, it's normally summer league that we would have in July here in the NBA. And then you would roll over, take a, a quick little break for a month and a half. And then you're getting ready at the end of September to go to training camp. Well, now who knows what the, the re the, the, the start of the next season is going to look like, let alone, you know, finishing out this season and determining the champion. So when you think about people who are going to struggle, it's going to be a lot of the younger talent, in my opinion, that's also going to um, lose out and have to figure out how they are going to uh, transition and where they're going to transition to. You know, I think you bring up a very good point, Mo. Uh, I have some personal friends of mine uh, who are sending kids off to school in the U.S. And some of them have scholarships uh, for sports, whether it's tennis or other sports. But now there's a lot of talk about these sports being canceled or delayed. And if there's no sports in college, what do these guys do, right? That's kind of why they are going to school. So my heart goes out to, as you said before, the younger generation uh, who is really most vulnerable with it. Uh, you know, it, it's a very good point, Mo, and maybe Leif and David, uh, we can try to think about what can you guys do as the sports marketing gurus to make sure that the funnel, you know, continues uh, so that they can be future, you know, champions in the world today? Any thoughts on that, Lee and David? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that, you know, it's what Mo brings up is the impact that you don't read about or hear about. All you hear about is the, you know, rich players that are, you know, that, oh, they're being whiny in these negotiations and they don't need the money and everything. And there's a lot of players out there that do need the money. There's a lot of kids that, to Mo's point, that they might not have been on the, the, the top two rounds of the draft, but they shined in the NCAA double tournament. And they were that, you know, every year you have that Cinderella draft pick that he launches up the board. Take baseball. Baseball players who are in a lower price point just across the board anyway, um, the minor leaguers are just out of work. They're not getting to restart their teams. And then I think it's 40 or 28 teams that are all bankrupt. That they, they, they don't, the team doesn't even exist anymore. And so the, the impact of that is great. But, you know, I'm going to try to spin this on a positive note. Players and the, the model, the old model of a Korean brand wanting to access uh, a famous star for their brand and calling up, um, you know, the local Korean big, uh, huge agency who calls CAA, and the, the, the athlete never hears about that. And because of this digital kind of transformation where you can directly access an athlete, the athletes hear about, they, they, the brand can contact them through us through directly. We go right to the players, and it gives an opportunity that the players never knew existed that from Korea or from Asia. They never, they, even the agents didn't really understand this. And then with these more non-traditional, um, you know, TikToks and all your, your Instagrams and all that, it's a much lower price point. So there isn't that barrier to entry. You don't have to be the size of Coca-Cola or Nike in order to endorse an athlete. And kind of what I touched on in the beginning, you can target a specific athlete or a specific sport that fits your demographic and brand the best. And we were on the phone today, David and I, with a, a startup um, in a drink company that's all natural for athletes. And we're working, we, we'd set out some 
highlighted athletes that we feel would be a good partner for their brand. And again, they're more knowledgeable, they understand their marketplace better, and they wanted tier two and tier three athletes for more non-traditional sports, such as the WNBA rather than the NBA. They knew what they wanted because this would, they felt would appeal most to their target demographic and they would get the best bang for their buck. So, you know, there's a question that just came online uh, from, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, Charles Sheng from uh, APG. Uh, his question is, hey, how do companies survive when events are canceled and there's negative revenue? And I'm sure it's global, right? Uh, so, David, uh, any smart answers there? Are companies changing their entire business model around? Like, how are you guys surviving? Yeah, I mean, well, again, it's so much of it is we need to all, every industry has to figure out how to go digital. I mean, that's kind of the short, that's the, the low hanging fruit, which isn't, and the bigger of a company you are, the harder that can be because your processes aren't set up to be, you know, completely digital. But I think everybody needs to be more nimble and see where there's opportunity. And so you take, um, a huge company, Walmart, for example, they, so they, they, they saw the opportunity in America, how, um, in, you know, in the summer, it's a rite of passage as a child to go to summer camp, right? Well, of course, this summer, nobody's going to summer camps because of COVID. Walmart saw the opportunity and they basically created a, a digital summer camp and they got some pretty big names like LeBron James and a couple, um, Hollywood actors to actually be the camp counselors. And so they're instructing children on how to paint and do arts and crafts and stuff like that. And the point of that story is that that's not your traditional sponsorship. Uh, it's definitely not a traditional way of marketing, but it is something that makes people tune in and it is something that you can pull off digitally, but you have to get creative and want to do that. Now, LeBron James is, you know, arguably the most famous athlete on the planet right now. So I would assume that price tag was fairly high, but there's a lot of athletes out there who aren't necessarily even remotely close to that kind of price point. And to your guys' point earlier about um, some of these younger athletes, right, who maybe they just got drafted into the NBA and maybe they're not well known in the NBA circle, but they're probably pretty well known in their college circles and in their hometowns and they're probably heroes. Now that we have technology, we can really micro target our our customer base, use it, you know, on e-commerce platforms or with Facebook advertising or whatever it might be, you can really pinpoint who your target audience is. And so it makes more sense to start leveraging some of these other smaller talent to really hyper target who your client base is. And to Leif's point, you can really package in then a more cost effective and just plain effective campaign. So I think that's a long answer to say it. companies need to start thinking digitally and how to reach their audiences um, in non-traditional ways. You know, I think uh, your answer, Dave, resonates very nicely with us as well. You know, at AmCham Korea, we have 30 board of governors and uh, we get pretty factual information on how they're doing. Uh, and obviously there are companies that are having real difficult times, mainly mm -hmm. travel industries, yeah. hotels and so on. Uh, how do you recover from that? But other companies, are actually holding down their fort pretty, pretty well. And it's because of their ability to transform. So Mo, uh, you work or know so many athletes today. Uh, and we spoke about some of the winners and some of the losers, not in a negative sense, but just the way the industries are. Uh, what are Who are some of the athletes that you're aware of who have really done something special to change the game? because I think they're the ones who should be the real role models for athletes going forward. Yeah, most certainly. Well, for one, Patrick Mahomes just changed the game with that $500 million yeah. contract. <laughs> and uh, in, in terms of, you know, on a serious note, I mean, it's obviously shown that sports is still resilient enough to uh, keep the fans in, engaged, to uh, continue to, to build teams, to just sign the legacy contract. Um, one, of the con one of the individuals that, Leif and Dave and I worked with uh, closely here, uh, a Houston Texan, A.J. Moore. He's a um, free safety for the Houston Texans. He just uh, did a, a giveaway in his hometown. He gave away bottled water, supplies, uh, you know, tangibly went out. They took risks. They gave away masks, uh, doing things like that to engage uh, their communities. Um, 
you know, a lot of uh, individuals have done well to, to tell their story, um, as, as David spoke about, just through social media, leveraging their, their digital, uh, you know, uh, mediums to reach their target audience. And, you know, whether it was virtual workouts, whether it was just uh, simply engaging and, and helping um, individuals to stay uh, motivated and encouraged. And that was something that I've seen, you know, a few things that I've seen just uh, examples of how athletes have continued to try to stay active, uh, engaged, and continue to uh, maximize their influence. You know, uh, for, for our audience, uh, you know, Mo mentioned uh, Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I talked about Mookie Betts. Uh, we've had really huge superstars who are gaining, what, uh, $500 million contracts, $350 million contracts, and it's just unthinkable in, in some countries, right? So, Leaf and David, I'd love to see some of that in Korea. Uh, what can the Korea ecosystem learn from the U.S. on how to make sports, sports marketing, the sports athletes, get these kind of contracts and make it a big opportunity for, for advertisers, for sponsors, and for the athlete themselves? I, you know, I, I think the, the, the first part, first answer to that is um, we need to re remember that athletes are brands themselves. So they, they carry a lot of power and a lot of marketability just in who they are in the way that they appeal to the common person. Um, you know, I can't speak on, on Korea um, in a highly educated way, but from what I have seen, you know, it, it definitely seems that um, the opportunities are a little less or they're a lot shorter in span for athletes you're kind of famous and then and then you're not um and i think that's a shame because there is a lot of opportunity there are a lot of people who um who follow these people and they're going to be influenced by what they say and what they do so i think with a little more emphasis on sports marketing that would be a good first step another thing that i've seen and again i'm not this is more of my opinion, but it seems that in the Korean market, the agents very tightly control the narrative. The, the agencies themselves, they really don't. I mean, we talk about how it's it's difficult in the U.S. to actually get a proposal in front of an athlete through their agent. In Korea, it's even harder. Um, and so I think if if there is a way to get to the to the athletes themselves and start start to emphasize the athletes as a brand and as a story i think you would start to see um more people realizing that there's a lot of ways to monetize athletes in, in their stories and the athletes themselves would would benefit from it quite a bit any comments from you leaf on this on this topic no i think the mookie bets is kind of covers every bit of that that entire narrative i mean he is a winner he Again, usually in the past, it would be a brand that came with that concept and said, Mookie, we want to pay you to talk about Korea because we've got a brand or, you know, we've got product in Korea we want to sell. And that was Mookie being a brand himself, seeing that there was a, a fan base, great players, a great country, a great culture, great food that the American people needed to find out about. And he went to his agents and said, I want you to do this for me. And, and the, the plan was to do it in Japan as well. And he did it, financed it himself with our help and your great help too. Thank you, James. And, um, you know, in a COVID environment, filmed the video. Um, you know, we had a, 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 a Korean um, translator to help him pronounce the words and make and it was all done through zoom technology the director of the video all the editors of the video we were all spread out across the world and we did this effective video and in a covid and complete lockdown environment he was just able to expand his fan base by millions across asia and more importantly let america know about these great stars in korea what david was talking about is what we found shocking is here the MVP of the MLB and now the you know third highest player in, 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 in the MLB was reaching out to some of these players and some of your gl more global minded agents that you know that it obviously they were all about it but other agents that we spoke to were basically well how much are you going to pay for this and and kind of a, a, a wall and this is kind of what we saw years ago when we were trying to bring Asian deals to the American market. And so it's just going to take a little time to evolve. But I think once they see the results 
and see how that branding has just gone viral across both countries, it'll evolve quickly. Well, you know, as I see uh, sports in Korea, uh, obviously we have a huge mega star at the Premier League today. Uh, we have uh, a few baseball stars from Korea that are playing in the Major League Baseball. And the Korean ladies golfers are actually doing really, really well. Uh, when do you think uh, we'll see, besides baseball, some Asian players or Korean players getting into the NFL or even the NBA? Uh, I know both just got off, but uh, your perspective would be important because they're the ones who can drive the next generation of, uh, of, of interest and opportunities for, for Koreans uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a global stage. Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing it already. There's a huge desire, and I mean, we see it in every Asian market that we're in. Uh, the, um, you know, everybody always knows the Yao Ming moment when, you know, Yao came over and that kind of launched the NBA in China and it's all the fans. I and mean, you've had Korean stars for years in the MLB. I think it's continually, uh, I think it's just going to be more and more. Japan just sent their first player to play in the NBA and, you know, Rui Hachimura, which has kind of exploded the popularity in the NBA. And David and I, when we're, um, you know, in addition to meeting brands and everything, we're oftentimes meeting governments, teams, uh, you know, apparel brands, and all, all of them are now talking about what do we need to do to get our youth up to the next level. And so um, it was a real touching moment for us when we brought the MVP of the NFL over to Japan and a lot of the, the interviewers asked him and he, he and Adrian Peterson and he said it in China he said it in Japan you're already there it's just now we got to move him to the next step and, and and get it there he, but he, he he said I've watched you you've got the skills you've got everything that's needed it's now just transitioning to that into the U.S. sport so I think it's it's there and it's just going to keep continually to grow. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of, le you know, every league's not exactly at the same place with their international ambitions, you could say. I mean, the NBA is kind of that shining example that really put in the effort and and um, and they're starting to draft or get players from different parts of the world, and they have been for a while. The NFL hasn't been as active, obviously, in Asia, and it's a shame because, you know, they do have some activity and, and there's definitely – football programs and um, NFL uh, offices in some of these different markets, but you're not seeing as much of that connection and kind of that farm system to get the players over to the U.S. So really a lot of the, um, you know, I mean, of course, there's there's people like Heinz Ward who was Korean Americans, um, but to get people from Korea to go play in those leagues, you really need to build those bridges. And it's the same thing we're talking about. And th the biggest shame of all of this, in my opinion, is that, you see kind of those these agents or kind of the management groups kind of close themselves off and they they try to protect what they have and that that's on in every country you know around the world and that's those are those barriers you have, we have to start breaking down we have to let athletes know what their opportunities are and give them opportunity to actually travel abroad to work with brands in different markets and I think you'd start seeing a lot more. It's basically an inefficient market is what it is. And so we have to figure out how to make it efficient. Hey, Mo, you know, I, I respect and like Leaf and David for their sports acumen, but you're the true athlete over there and you've seen <laughs> a lot in action, okay? But, you know, I know a lot of us, uh, we think there are good athletes in Korea as well. But, you know, especially in the NBA or even the NFL, when can I see one of my fellow Koreans getting a good team? I, I think we have Eugene Chung from the Patriots is playing, right? One of my friends from years ago, by, a guy by the name of John Lee, was the first NFL player, a Korean guy from UCLA, but he's a kicker, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mo, uh, walk me through when can I see a Korean play in the NBA or in the NFL with some success? Well, hopefully soon. I mean, you know, I was a part of the agency that represented Jeremy Lin. And Jeremy mm -hmm. Lin, first American-born Asian player to play in yeah. the NBA and have great success in the NBA. And as David and Leif has mentioned, um, as you continue to build that bridge in terms of uh, um, marrying and uniting 
uh, international sports and, and replicating some of the systems that have been built here in the U.S. Um, and then transplanting them into uh, different uh, international and emerging markets, I think you will see um, that players are there, like they mentioned with Adrian Peterson. Um, you know, I think another great way to uh, continue to accelerate the growth of the Korean-born players is to also have those uh, leagues and agencies to sign players from the U.S. so that those players can continue to refine their skill set and compete against them and learn, um, you know, just some of the different things that helps them to be better and, and, and leverage those competitive advantages to go and, and get that exposure. One of the players that we've all worked with together is, is Joseph Young. He's, you know, lights it up in the CBA, can score with ease, and yet here's a guy who wasn't able to have the same kind of success in the NBA, but yet you see those different talent sacks and skill sets, and that's what it takes. It takes us uh, competing against one another and, and, and really learning um, those different uh, skill sets that are needed to be able to play, so hopefully really soon. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, uh, with some of the, the time we have left, uh, I think a lot of us are interested to hear about some Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant stories. I know you were with them, you know, for, for a long time. Uh, I know with Michael Jordan from a business side, I think he played against them. Uh, what makes these guys so so special in your, your, in your mind? Because I think they're great role models for, you know, future athletes. Uh, and even for even for business people, because a winner is a winner, regardless of what they do. Uh, so if you can give us your perspective, that would be very interesting. Sure, I was I was uh, fortunate to be able to play against Michael Jordan um, as in college when he was uh, having his Michael Jordan camp. He used to recruit a lot of the all Americans from around the country, and I was able to go to his camp twice and be a part of his uh, you know uh, intimate experience. I guess he would have where he would. A challenge a lot of the up and coming uh, talent to kind of I think scout us out and see who who would be in the NBA that he could try to take advantage of or need to be on the lookout for. But things that he um and I played against him my rookie year as well in the NBA in 2001 when he was with the Wizards. And uh, the thing that always impressed me about Michael Jordan, similar to Kobe Bryant, um a lot of people in the U.S. make the the um, hypothetical um, you know question who's better between LeBron and Kobe and Michael Jordan and and it wasn't it wasn't close with Michael Jordan in his prime. Like it, he was a perfect uh, blend of, as you said, high basketball and sports bas uh, IQ. So he's very very highly intelligent. He thought the game. He was able to uh, to, to 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 think it. But he was also um, he married great work ethic with high skill. And so most players are usually really talented in one vertical. They can shoot well, they can dribble well, they can pass well. He could do all of those things well, and he was highly athletic. He was tall, he had big hands, get all of the different features. And when he you marry that with the competitive um, will that he had to succeed and be the best, it just wasn't close. And, um, and you can look at that from when he came in, he was averaging you know, 30, 40 points uh, early in his career and, and winning scoring titles. And then he was able to shift his game, even while he was still the very best player in the world, to being able to empower those around him and include his teammates. And that's how he ended up winning six championships. You know, Mo, I grew up, grew up uh, watching people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar play, where I thought he was the GOAT. Uh, but I see the financial markets have changed tremendously uh, now than when Kareem was what I used to call the GOAT, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the whole markets have changed. NBA contracts have changed. Uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Maurice, but who are your top five NBA players of all time? Well, um, again, Michael and Jordan. And one of them. <laughs> he, he, unfortunately, Captain, we call him Cap, you know, I played for the Lakers and he sat behind the bench and, and he, he unfortunately isn't one. But he's, he's probably in my top uh, 10 or 15 players. But for me, I would, I would certainly have LeBron James be – uh, my point guard, I always go about this. Uh, Michael Jordan shooting guard. I would have Kobe Bryant play my. Uh, mm. I guess we're having some technical difficulty. We'll wait for Maurice to get back to us. <laughs> but hey, Leaf and, and, and David, uh, 
in the business world, who do you think are the best uh, business guys uh, out there for sports? I'm talking about athletes who have really done a great job of, of becoming business people in their own right. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, Kobe was very good at that. Uh, uh, Harden. Um, it, this is something that's been really cool to see from, you know, our perspective because we're around them and is that, um, you know, they've taken control of their brand and it's, it's, right. it's been refreshing. It's been, um, it's, it's easier to more accessible. They go after projects that they, that they are passionate about. So they do more with it. And, and so, um, I mean, Kobe, obviously, with the, the body armor, and, and I mean, we could just name many. I mean, Kyrie Irving is a real interesting example because everything that he does has to tie into some social community service component that he is passionate about. So you could offer Kyrie Irving, you know, millions of dollars from, and, and if it's not something that fits what he's passionate about, who he supports, who he is as a person, he won't even touch it. And so it's given the player a lot more control. And for us in the, the business world, we love these, that there's that, it just much more flexibility because they, um, you know, you can target certain athletes with certain brands. You can target um, a, a certain niche sport, kind of to your point. Um, we've had, <laughs> we have, we've had Chinese brands that, when they initially contacted us, they only wanted golfers. And so we're thinking Tiger Woods and all these brands, but no, it was only Korean women golfers that they wanted and, and Asian women golfers because they thought, thought that was gonna be a much more effective for their brand. And so that control of the players knowing what their brand value is and how they can stream and talk to people, it, this is just, this is a beautiful thing to watch from our, our side because it's, it's just flourishing. Right. Yeah, and w w we could probably talk about th this because so I could talk about this for probably 30 minutes and I won't. But, you know, there's other people like Kevin Durant who's really started getting into the media space and he, you know, he's produced his own documentaries. Um, you've got, I don't know if you guys saw recently, uh, Los Angeles is, is going to be the next uh, city for a women's soccer team yeah. and so they're they're partially owned by a group of former uh, u.s women national players uh, i mean there's so many examples lance armstrong um who's really heavily in, um uh invested in, in an actual investment group that invests in sports sciences across the world so i mean there's so many examples um steph curry so uh, yeah, i think what you guys are talking about is is no different than any business person would right an athlete is a business. And right. how they use social media, you know, right. digital formation is what makes a big change. No different from any brick and mortar business today. Right. So right. I think it's uh, it's an interesting, uh, you know, topic. Uh, you know, the Korean LPGA, uh, the, the, the women golfers are doing really, really well globally. Uh, and yet I think in the US, many of these golfers are still not well known. So if he had to give them some advice, uh, what would it be beyond Korea? I'd say number one, push your agents to be on your side. So um, really have, have a goal that you want to grow your brand globally and make the team around you give you those results. And if you don't pay attention to the team around you sometimes, you know, you, you just never know if somebody has your best interest or not. So I would say that starts with number one is really taking control of your own narrative and of your own brand. Um, and I think the opportunities come from that. Mm. And Mo, uh, yeah, I know we had some I technical, have... I know we had some technical difficulties. So I'm gonna get you back on the spot on your on your top five NBA players, if he had to pick them. Man, I apologize. It's been um, probably the worst Zoom call in terms of technology I've ever had. So I'm so sorry to everybody on the call and all those who are listening. But yeah, quickly, um, obviously, I don't know what you guys heard, but again, Michael Jordan, uh, Kobe Bryant, uh, Kevin Durant, um, um, you know, I said LeBron James, and then I would probably go Will Chamberlain as, as my uh, center. Wow. Well, Kareem's not gonna like what he just said, but it's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, he, I think he'll get over it. I mean, he's, a, he's as I said, he's been a, a really great uh, mentor at different times for me and for a lot of other players. One yeah. quick thing I wanted to say, just along the line of, of the question.
question you asked David about, you know, Korean athletes and, and connecting to the brands. Um, and I think that, as he said, control your narrative, be very intentional about your brand, but I also would say align with different companies and products that can also push your brand to your, to your target audience. Uh, Jordan, Michael, huge example. His on-court success was second to none in terms of what he accomplished in his sport. But one of the things that elevated him and still continues to elevate him 20 years beyond his playing days is the fact that he still has one of the very uh, best products in the Jordan shoe brand that, that, that just really helps him to still be number one on the money list. When you look at Michael Jordan, you know, Nike signed him um, early in his career. They, they paid him, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, which is probably equivalent to a million dollars or so uh, then. But they had just hoped to make uh, $3 million by year four. And in year one, they sold more than $126 million worth of uh, shoes. So that just shows you that when you're intentional and you work with companies that are also aligned with your brand, there's a, a lot of things that can expand and accelerate you into the marketplace. Well, I know that uh, you know we're almost uh, you know up in time, but I wanted to thank uh, you know all of you for for participating in our webinar. Uh, as someone who enjoys sports personally, I think it's a great uh, you know opportunity for for everybody, and in particular, uh, I'd love to see more Korean companies invest in sports in the U.S. because that can make them more of a local. U.S. marketing brand, which would be helpful. And I think the three of you, Leaf, David, and Mo, uh, you guys have a lot of domain knowledge. I hope that you guys would spend more time in Korea because this is a big opportunity with 49 million people, uh, people who are passionate about sports but not knowing how to maximize on it yet. So we hope that the three of you can come back to Korea. And Mo, I'd love to personally uh, you know, get you in Korea. I want to see if I can have a one-on-one -on -one NBA game with you. At least a game of horse, okay, Mo? Uh, I, look, I, look, I, look forward, I look forward to it, and I look forward to going over with Leif and David and continuing to, uh, to develop the relationship. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to have us all on and for bearing with me personally through all the challenges. Uh, of course. Take the challenge. I, don't know if I, can, I don't know if I can beat you on a game of horse, but I think I can take on Leif. I don't know about David yet, but we'll find out, okay? <laughs> all right gentlemen thank you so much for all spending right. your evening with us okay thank, thank you. you and have a great day all right, all right. All right. thank you